Hi, my name is Tarani and I'm a yoga educator based out of Mumbai. Um, I've been teaching yoga for about two years uh, now. But prior to that, I was actually in a completely corporate setup where I was um, a corporate lawyer for about six years in a firm. Um, and honestly, what drove me to change was the lifestyle. It was not something that I found very sustainable. It was long hours, very, very high stress situations. Um, I would sometimes find myself working till like 4 a.m. and then having to go back in the morning or having to get on a flight and go to a negotiation somewhere else in the, in the country. And for me, I found that when you talk about work and work-life balance, I didn't really have that um, to a point where I was happy. Like a lot of people, a lot of the lawyers I knew or I know were very happy with that situation, but I was not. So I had to, I realized I had to change. It took me about a year to make up my mind to quit and then another year to do it. So that's how I did it. And once I did it, there was no looking back. I uh, went off to Mysore for a couple of months and trained there and then came back and started teaching yoga full time. It's like I said before, it's been about two years now. And I honestly think it was the best decision I made because I'm a happier person. I'm in a better place. And honestly, um, I don't miss being a lawyer at all. So I think for me, it was the right decision. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask you a very uh, related question to being a corporate lawyer because I am one myself. Oh. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, for somebody who is got a corporate job, let's say a corporate lawyer, mm -hmm. and wants to balance or have some kind of balance in their life, is there anything that you think you could, um, is there any guidance or tip you have for those people? What can they do? they do to maintain that balance or equilibrium to manage a high stress job and to have peace of mind and stay happy? Um, I think that's a really great question about finding balance. For me to find balance, I think you have to sit, take time out and understand what are your priorities. For some people, their priorities are their job, getting ahead in the corporate life, getting being, by a, being a certain designation by a certain age is really what drives them. But for a lot of other people, there are kind of, I mean, at least in the Indian perspective, things that are not perceived as successful, like I want to be happy, I want to be free, I want to be the master of my time. I want to not wake up and think, oh, why am I doing this today? Or why do I have to go to Delhi for five days and like sit in this hotel room, whatever. So I think the first thing is to identify your priorities. If your mental health and your well-being are a priority, then you need to make time for it. If you think it's a priority and you're not making time for it, then really it's not a priority for you at that point. Something else is. So it, I would say it's really important to identify your priorities. And once you have that, work towards your top three goals. If finding time is a more important goal, then maybe um, whenever you can, between deals or between court dates or whatever it is, find time to spend time either by yourself, in nature, with your family, with your pets, with your animals, whatever it is. If it's mental health, take time to check out of your emails, your notifications, your social media, stuff like that. Reconnect with nature. So really it all begins, in my opinion, with setting your priorities. That's great, yeah. Tarni, I want to ask you, why did you choose yoga amongst everything else that you may, could have you know, switched to? Why, you, why yoga? Honestly, it didn't feel like there was a lot else I could switch to because I didn't want to be in a firm. I, I didn't want to be in another firm setup because I was at one of the firms that were not as bad as like the top three firms. Um, so I know that the change wouldn't make a difference because I had friends in the field. I know I didn't want to go in-house as a counsel because I was too young then. It would just be like not, not what I wanted to do. And for me, I think that I really enjoyed practicing yoga. Like it would be my me time and I would just feel so good after, after practice and connecting with those people. I, I find that the mindset of a yoga teacher slash practitioner and a lawyer are quite different. One is always looking, if I may, for the, the issue, whereas the other one is just kind of happy to be. Um, so to me, it made sense because I've been practicing already for about 10-ish years at that point. 
so it made sense that that's what I wanted to do, and I was really drawn to it. I did my DEC, my teacher training course, uh, two years before I decided to quit, never thinking that it would be something that I would do, but something drew me to it, and I just kind of yes. Okay, so it was it was quite an uh, an easy shift. You had already you were already kind of prepped in yoga by the time you decided to make the move. So you were thinking about it for a few years by the time you made the move finally. It started off with me being, I can't do this anymore. What else can I do? And then by process of elimination, no, I don't want to go into an MBA. I don't want to study more. I don't want to get into a business. I don't want to do this. It started off by elimination. What can I do? And then this is something that felt natural, like a natural shift. I'll go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, by asking you why this particular form of yoga, there are several forms of yoga, but why, you know, the, the Mysore uh, Ashtanga form? Um, so there are several different types of yoga. One is an Ayangar style of yoga, which uses a lot of props, very, very alignment focused, um, very focused on putting the body in alignment without the body feeling too much, if I can say, uh, without forcing it, more assisting it. Then there is the Ashtanga style, which I started off with. And the Ashtanga Vinyasa style is a set sequence of asanas that you do day after day. And it's really funny that I grew, I, I went into that because every other person or like out of 10 people, six other people were lawyers in that class. So I feel it's a very, very um, type A personality um, kind of practice. Uh, so I used to practice that, which is why it felt easy to teach Vinyasa. I don't uh, really teach Ashtanga Vinyasa, I teach it sometimes, but I mostly teach Vinyasa, which is the joining of postures, because it just feels a little bit more fun and creative, and every day I can give somebody something different, and you still feel like worked out, but at the same time, you still have that good vibe, and that good kind of, you know, you come out of Shavasana feeling like, okay, fine, yeah, that feels good. Yeah, I can vouch for that. I feel like that after all your classes, that's for sure. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to get into the classes. Um, what is it that you want as a teacher? And like from the student, what is it that you want to impart to the people you teach? And more on what do you want the students? I'm going to use the word student. I don't know if there's another word for it, but for them to take away from your classes. Um, I think when, when you come to my um, class as a teacher, I want you one to feel like, looking forward to it. I want you to be like, okay, we have this today. I'm really looking forward to it. I want to be able to do it. Or I want to be able to do all the opening postures to get to it. And then at the end of it, I want you to feel like, okay, that was really worth my time and I feel great. And I can go back to my life feeling so good that whatever happens, I can manage it. I just want the person feeling really, really nice after they're done. That's about it. It doesn't matter how, whether you can put your leg behind your head or come into a full split or stand on your hands or your fingertips, whatever. I don't really, I don't really, that doesn't matter to me. What matters is that you walk away feeling much better than when you came onto your mat. Um, Tarni, is the, this feeling of feeling good, right? Is it more that you've got to work out or more that mentally you have um, exhausted yourself or you have been completely present in the moment while doing the class. So which of the two do your classes focus on um, in a way? I would like to say that I focus more on being present because I don't demo anything too much. I, I, I'm just going to say that again because I scratched my face. I would like to say that it focuses more on um, being present and uh, really kind of putting everything else you have on the back burner and just really being in the now because I feel like a lot of the times we're caught between the past and worrying about the future or thinking about what we have to do. So we're never really present. For me, it's about being absolutely present and saying, okay, when you feel, you feel the asana in the moment, you're kind of experiencing that moment through your body and through your breath. For me, it's kind of that because I don't really demo too much. So people are not constantly looking at the screens. Yeah, sometimes we do a breakdown or whatever. But for me, it's um, really focusing on being present. So I'll give like very, very detailed cues to the best of my ability, hoping that you can um, flow through the cues so that your mind is working on the cues, but your kind of body and breath are flowing with the movement. Yeah. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What What are the other parts of yoga that, besides the asanas, that you like to um, emphasize on? Is there anything else? Is it the dhyana, the meditation, or any other parts of yoga that you like that are important to you and you like to uh, practice and teach? So for me, I think it's a few of the different parts. I won't say it's all. Uh, asana definitely because we're coming into a very physical practice and when you have practiced one form for a while you kind of want to peel back the layers and go a little bit deeper which is why I've introduced or I've, at least in my classes um, now maybe I didn't have them before which is why I've introduced that little I have a little like five to seven minute meditation at the beginning so you kind of really arrive onto your mat take your time to forget about the rest of the day and then start focusing on your breath and coming into practice. So for me, I would say it's definitely your dhyan, your focus, or your concentration, and a little bit of breath work. We may not move into like um, very, very traditional pranayam, but just focusing really on the on how the full breath feels. Because when we're not present, you and I are breathing right now, but we're not really paying attention to it. It's just happening in the background. We're, we're paying attention on what we're saying right now. So it's nice to be able to just take a few moments and focus on the breath. As a personal practice, I really also do focus on asana and I do focus a little bit more on meditation. And for me, meditation and breath go hand in hand. So I'd say the two of them together, personal practice wise. Can you tell me a little bit on uh, what are your practice for meditation? Do you do, uh, do it to, to some kind of music? Do you follow some particular uh, gurus who share meditations what works for you so for me honestly it's not about um sitting in silence in a room focusing it's just really being present with whatever i'm doing so even if it's me drinking tea it's me being super present and drinking that tea with all my focus so that i can really taste the tea if it's me spending time with a cat of mine it's me being present with that uh, cat to give her or him the attention at the end of the day it's me just kind of going through the day seeing what I did that I didn't really like what I did that I really liked it's kind of really um, I would say just an attempt not to divert my mind elsewhere and just be really really present how did you get here how does one get to this part like when did you find this way of life where you can be focused and present every moment? I don't think I'm there yet. I'm not, I think I'm not there at all. Um, I think the want to be there came from the fact that I honestly um, spent so many years not being present completely. Like I would, my, so I have a pretty tight group of friends from college and they would be like, oh, you remember when we did this? And I'd be like, no, I don't think I was there. So they were like, no, you were there. I remember you were there. And I would just have no memory of it. So it actually stemmed from the fact that I never um, was fully present at that time. I really have no idea what I was thinking about. Clearly, that was not a good option because I was not there and I don't even know what I was thinking about. So it really stemmed from the fact that I want to be present. I want to give X and Y in front of me my full attention. Sounds like, uh, Tarani, that, you know, it's kind of like enhancing the quality of your life and somebody really wants to pursue that, um, that need or that, uh, that desire for their life. Is that what you had internally or lying latent that you then started actively uh, moving into this space? Um, or did it just come and land on you, thud? Uh, no, I don't think it landed on me. I think it was a conscious decision to sort of reflect a bit more. I think um, I spent a lot of time just kind of going with the flow when I was younger and I didn't really feel like I focused my energy on what I wanted until I made that decision to kind of leave that corporate lifestyle behind and then from there it kind of took on a life of its own that, you know, I'm going to try to be as present as I can. Obviously, we all have times when we're not completely present. Sometimes I even forget what I'm saying in class while I'm saying it. Um, so 
we are all human after all that does happen but i think it's they just the need to kind of or for me the the desire to be absorbed by what i'm doing because if i'm not absorbed then what am i doing yeah that makes sense but strange you know like sometimes life just lands you up in certain ways that you least expect i mean you you start out with one thing and then you're completely caught by surprise and um, you know i don't know do you think that for people uh, one has to actively seek these things out or sometimes it just happens in like chance happenings and you know uh, around bends and corners that you've never kind of anticipated um if i can tell you what happened with me when kind of this thing went off in my head so it was um a day when i was in my morning rush to get out the door to go to work i would like wake up go to yoga come back shower change eat and run out the door okay so in this big thing to run out the door with my laptop bag my handbag my lunch bag whatever whatever my coffee i slipped and i fell and i had glass dabbas they went smashing everywhere so i was like whatever i'll leave it and i'll just go cuz i'm getting late for a meeting um so i went and then i could feel my foot is really warm so i was like what what is that on my foot so i looked down and my shoe was full of blood because i got a massive cut from one of the glass pieces and it had all dripped into my shoe so i was like god this is not the time for this so i called my husband i was like please come on i think i need some help just help me with this foot or whatever just bring some cotton let's just finish off quickly and i'll go so he's like okay fine and it wouldn't stop bleeding so he said you need to come home and elevate the leg so i was like okay fine i'll just text my boss saying i'm going to be a little late so i went i elevated my leg for about 10 minutes the moment i put it down it started oozing again <coughs> so he's like i think we need to go to the hospital and get some stitches done because i don't think it's going to stop unless you take something for it so the reason i really don't have time for that can we just do something and later i'll get the stitches after i'm done with this whatever i had to do for the day he's like i think we should go so i went to holy family hospital my call had started i was on my work phone and my boss was on the other phone i was like listen i'm at the hospital i'm getting stitches i'll just call you later so she she was fine with it but the client was on the line and the nurse is with her needle in her hand stitching my leg and i was like can you please be quiet while i'm on this uh, on this call she's like i'm asking if you want a painkiller i was like do what you want i don't care i need to take this call <laughs> so that is when my husband was like what is wrong with you you are literally in the hospital bleeding somebody is stitching you and you're telling them to be quiet so i think that is really what kind of um, cemented the decision that you know this is not a lifestyle i can take that's a good that's a really good story thanks for sharing that you're welcome i actually haven't shared that story publicly ever yeah, that's a good story yeah i'm so glad you took that step yeah and you know even after that um i went, i drove to work after that i was on medication that made me sick because i was allergic to the medication i threw up like four times in office after that and i still wouldn't go home and my boss was like you need to go home you need to take care of this situation i was like yeah but this guy really needs it and she was like no it's okay somebody else will do it just go so yeah that's also some crazy commitment though but this is a better life and way of life to be committed to i would agree with that for sure i think if that didn't happen i'd still be some unhappy lawyer somewhere so yeah, you're happy and content now we can you can say that for sure yeah much more content that's great but do you think it's a it's a it's a it's a goal post that one has to constantly try to achieve in a way because i'm sure even for people who do yoga who meditate it's a bit of a slippery slope i'm sure you can't be in that constant state all the time i mean you can't be in a constant state of anything all the time right you can't be constantly happy constantly sad you kind of have your ups and downs the ups kind of make up for the downs and the downs help you appreciate the ups so you can't really be in one state forever anyway so yeah as long as you're kind of happy in general with the direction of your life and you're like okay this will also be okay then i think it's okay yeah what helps you when you're down what do you do when you're down to come back up oh that's a good question what do i do when i'm down i think i just get out of my head because um my biggest thing is that i kind of go from 0 to 100 very quickly so i kind of get myself out of the situation either i um, allow myself to wallow in it for a bit and i'll be like okay now enough now either do something about it or change the situation so i'm very i'm a very action oriented person 
So if I don't like where something is going, I kind of have to mold it to where I want it to be. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's your lawyer side, I'm guessing, also, that keeps you actually side. I would think that's just her. I mean, I there are enough lawyers and I speak for the tribe in general that are not action oriented because they have no time to think proactively. They're always just playing catch up so much that nobody actually has, you know, the ability or time and ability to think about where they want their life to go. So that's kudos to you. Thank you. I actually have a lot of my ex colleagues now in class with me and like a lot of other lawyers. I think I think there's at least like half a dozen of them that come to class. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, you sorry? Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Sarva. That's fine. No, I was just. Do you, you know, when you're teaching, do you have any? Do you face any certain? Do you face certain challenges with your students, and do you try to use a one-size-fits-all approach, or do you kind of modify it based on who you're dealing with, and you know, how do you deal with somebody who sometimes just doesn't get what you're asking them to do? Good question. There are days where I have bad days when. There are so my classes are structured to be an all level class, but really, if you're a beginner, you will, if you've never done yoga before and you come to my class, you will be a little lost. And this is kind of the, um, the expectation that I set when anybody who's fresh to yoga comes to the class so that they're not feeling like you know complete at the end. So I kind of tell them you will feel lost for the first couple of times. But if you just learn to listen to my cues and learn to understand how I cue, you will be fine. So there are days when somebody is either having a bad day or they're just not fully present, which is fine. And I can see, okay, X is not there today with me, which is okay. So for the first couple of times, I'll let them go. Then I'll correct them a few times and be like, you know, do try, try it this way, try it that way. And then if they're still not doing it, I'll be like, okay, it's fine. They're just having a day where they need to be free. So let them be free. And that's about it. But when beginners come to my class and they're um, fidgeting a lot, that's what like um, kind of makes me want to tell them to relax a little bit. It's okay. It's not you don't do yoga good or well. It's not a. It's a practice. So you can have a good day today. You can have a bad day tomorrow. It's okay. That's about it. I think then I have to kind of catch myself getting a little annoyed and be like, calm down. It's it's just yoga. <laughs> and uh, Tarani, do you have any mentors or any teachers that you know you have referenced through your life in, in big and small ways? Um, so my first yoga teacher, I was really, really lucky. My first yoga teacher was uh, Deepika Mehta, who is uh, one of the best Ashtanga teachers currently um, in the world. So she was my first teacher that I actually... Um, went to so she's laid really a really good foundation for me in terms of movement of the body and thinking things about making yoga practice your meditation where you are fully absorbed in the moment another really great teacher that i've been to is uh bharat shetty who was in my who is in my soul um he taught me a lot of patience because when i was there for one month morning and evening he just made me do the same thing and by the end of it, I got so, so irritated that I was just like, he is really pushing my buttons. I don't know why he's making me do the same thing twice a day. But that really taught me some patience. So I would say Deepika and Parachetti have been quite, quite um, um, sort of instrumental in my journey. And now I do have more uh, teachers that I spend more one-on-one -on -one time with. So I have like my personal teacher um, who I train with uh, twice a week now. He's not a yoga teacher. He's uh, a gymnastics teacher. His name is Kushan Agarwal. He's really great. And uh, yeah, I would say these three are the ones that I kind of really uh, have really molded my practice, physical as well as uh, off the mat. I have two things that I want to probe into from, you know, the teachers and your mentors that you just spoke about. One is when you said Bharat Shetty made you do the same thing every day. Is, was it like the same asana or, same, or the same sequence for one month every day, twice a day? Yes. It was the same sequence, the same sequence, the same time, the same sequence every day. And I would just be like, why is he busy? 
And then you figured out it's to build your patience? I mean, it's the patient who wants to see your commitment. So, honestly, I did not um, like that mentally, but it's probably what I needed at that time because it was just after I had quit law. And I went to him. So, obviously, for me, at that point, I felt like I was all over the place mentally. And that kind of um, consistency to the point of irritation is really something that tested me. Ki, do I really want to do this? Like, this same thing on after twice a day, six days a week. And I feel like that kind of similar. If you can do that, then you can, you can do it. Interesting. I want to know why... Uh, are you now learning gymnastics or what is the need like why does one as a yoga teacher need to keep learning further how you know a little bit on that um so i got my gymnastics teacher because he is very very well versed with um, movement a lot of i i don't find that there is that quality of um instruction from and nuanced instruction from teachers. I find that when I go to a private class in yoga, it's pretty much like a group class, but one on one. So, I mean, I can do that in a group class as well, but when I go to, and maybe I haven't found the right teacher for this one on one practice style, but when I go to my um, gymnastic class, it's kind of more tailored for me. And I feel like it's, it's net, for me anyway, it's very essential to keep leveling up your training and keep learning and growing because only when you learn something new can you apply it and grow if you're just doing the same thing over and over again you're going to keep making the same mistakes and you're going to just going to keep doing the same thing but if you keep going to different teachers and learning different things like i even go to the gym and i do weights now i don't go to the gym the gym is zoom uh, but i do uh, zoom gym and i do weights as well now because i think Yoga is great, but also you need to kind of train your other muscles to do things as well. That's interesting. I I didn't think that you were also training in other forms of um, you know physical movement and workout forms. And and are you able to apply them in yoga as well? I think I'm actually able to apply yoga to the other trainings rather than and a bit of the other way as well. So if you take, for example, if I do an HIIT, I will definitely not be the fastest person there. Like I cannot do anything fast anymore. Maybe like one, two, three, I'll be like one, two, three. And like, you have to move faster. I'm like, I cannot move faster. This is my pace. So for me, it's not, I can't go faster. This is my pace. And that allows me to focus a lot more on my alignment. If I ever go to my gym trainer and do something with him, he's always like, your alignment is on point. You know what you're doing. So that awareness kind of builds, um, which I brought from yoga to the gym. When I teach yoga, I take some of the stuff that we don't really learn in yoga from the gym to there. So um, I don't know if you know this, but yoga focuses a lot, at least the Ashtanga style, on forward folds and hip openings. What that does sometimes is that kind of irritates the uh, hamstring and a sciatic nerve. Sometimes you feel a little bit of a, a tinge or pull or some sensitivity there. And I've learned in the gym really great stuff for strengthening that part, which is not really there in yoga practice. So it's allowed me to be able to offer a class that will stretch you and strengthen you without the risk of finding that injury or getting that injury, without overstretching, without pushing yourself too much. That's um, new knowledge for sure. I think you've done that class, Mandi, the glute one. Which one? Which one is this? The glute one where we go on the knees yeah. and we, the leg raises to the spine. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's from the gym. Right. I mean, I thought it was some part of some asan, you know, that, okay. So you, you've like it infused that into the class. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. And I, I really enjoy that. That doing that. I don't know, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. Nice. It just allows me to be, I feel it allows me to give a more holistic um, experience to the person coming to practice. And you kind of learn different movements. I mean, it's fun if it's yoga, but it's fun if it's yoga and a little bit of something else as well. Yeah, it, it's what you add 
to yoga. Your yeah, Tar- yeah. Tarni, I think um, you know it would be good for people to know what the difference between yoga is and traditional workouts because I think a lot of people conflate the two. They confuse one for the other, and I think everybody thinks that because they've done this yoga, it's a workout. So, and even for me, I'm not really familiar with the Ashtanga form of yoga. But is it the same thing, or is it different? Um, so Ashtanga yoga is very different than going to the gym and it's very different than other styles of yoga as well. Going to the gym, you probably have a circuit, you'll do your weights by yourself uh, with your trainer or um, uh, by yourself or with your trainer. Whereas if you're doing an Ashtanga series, it's a set sequence. So you can do it by yourself at home, follow the sequence. And that's actually called a Mysore style. You just do it by yourself, either by yourself or in a room full of people doing it together where the teacher walks around. But the main difference to me uh, between the gym and yoga is the mindfulness of it. It's really being present. It's not about getting 100 reps and being the fastest one and jumping the highest or whatever. It's just about being better than you were yesterday. Or if you have a bad day, getting back on your mat the next day. (laughs) To me, that is the essential difference between yoga and the gym and also i just like to say this once and for all yoga is not for flexible people it is for people to become flexible and strong i get a lot of people saying i can't do yoga because i'm not flexible that's like saying um i can't um, i don't know if you were a baby and you say i can't walk we would we'd all still be crawling everywhere So yeah, I think the main difference between the gym and yoga is the awareness and really, really focusing on your breath, staying in a posture, feeling it for however long you will be on to the camp. Yeah, that was I think it preps, Yeah, I think it preps you towards being more mindful, I suppose, yes. Like a teacher of mine always says that yoga is a, is a, a meditation in movement. Mm. A movement-based meditation. You have to be present. You have to know my, my fingers have to look this way, but it's not to look that way. Does this pinch my back? If it does, what can I do differently? It's kind of body awareness, mental awareness, just spirit awareness. And it's not easy to get there, you know, to like as someone who practices is what I feel like you keep drifting. It's so hard to like stay aligned over there. But when you get there is when you truly enjoy it. Yeah, and each day is also different. I'm sure you know this as a practitioner as well. Like some days you're like fully charged up and you want to really, you know, go for it. Some other days you're like, I don't really feel like doing it. But on both those days, you probably feel great afterwards. Yeah, that's true. Tani, I'm going to drift away from here a little bit. I want to know, is this, um, do you believe in having a purpose? Or, and is this what it is? Do you think you've found it? Um... That's a really heavy question. Yeah, I just saw on your list. Do I believe in having a purpose? I think I think that I have a purpose. My purpose may not be the same yesterday as it is today. Like for six years, my purpose was to be a lawyer. And my purpose may just be for me. It doesn't have to be for the whole world. It doesn't have to be for me to change the world and make it this amazing place. My purpose can just be to like live a good life or live a happy life. Um, and also I feel like Definitely, we all do have a purpose. It's a question of finding it. And sometimes to find the right purpose, you kind of have to go through the wrong one like I did. So for some time, my purpose was to be a lawyer. Right now, it's to be a yoga teacher. Tomorrow, maybe it will be to be something else. I don't know. But yeah, I do think that definitely we do have purpose. Mm, What I don't agree with is this mindset of there's only one purpose for life you know kind of like um, if you're equating purpose with career I think we need to kind of break away from the fact that people are meant for one career only you need to like find different things in your life that you want to do I know people who have moved from A to Z so yeah I do think there's purpose but your purpose can be personal it doesn't have to be a public purpose what do you? Oh, sorry. 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 No. Uh, do you do you have any uh, you know 
universal truth or do you have a certain value system that you believe in that keeps bringing you back on track in a certain way like sometimes you tell yourself something to get you back do you have uh, i yeah. think at the end of the day my only value system is are you okay that that happened like if for example i can give you a, a small example um there's this says there was a scat in my uh, compound and he had like a really mangled leg so i saw him for 3 days i was like you know i'm i'm not feeling good about this situation i need to do something about it and this cat does is not a friendly cat he's a bob cat he really doesn't like people or other animals he, he beat the crap out of my cat um and stuff like that so he's not a friendly guy but i couldn't see him in that pain you know limping around his leg bleeding and stuff so my husband and i actually caught him and took him to the vet and you know got him kind of um, neutered and whatever 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 and now he's our bungalow cat anyway and i'm okay with that i was not okay with the fact that he was running around with a lame uh, with a with a um, hurt leg so for me it's what are you okay with being um, present with and being um living with if there's something that i'm not okay with living with and i can do something about it i'm happy to do it if there's something that i'm not okay living with and i can't do anything about then i have to learn to accept it so for me it's at the end of the day what are you okay with that's a lot of sense you seem to have like a really good logical balance between the mind and the heart is that true like do you do something to keep that balance going do you you know how do you manage that um for me i just try to be really practical and think of and and think if i'm in a situation what is the worst outcome what is the best outcome and what can i do and where on the spectrum does that come if it's a little bit towards the best outcome okay i'll do it if it's towards the worst outcome i won't do it so i think it's just being very very um, practical obviously that doesn't happen all the time but i try to do it to the best of my ability yes what is next for you now you're already teaching you also now you can also teach people to be teachers right yeah. teacher training right you can yeah. also do that so is that next or is there already a plan ahead of that um so for me i really really love the um atmosphere of retreat spaces where you take people for a few days away take them out of their lives take them out of the their usual routine give them something completely new in a setting that would really make them feel good to wake up to give them morning movement sessions breath work evening movement sessions nutrition delicious meals so that they feel good for those days that's something that i really really find rewarding and i really enjoy doing so post pandemic whenever that happens i would really like to focus on more retreats like very very small retreats not like many people maybe 5 to 10 people maximum and just give them really good experiences for those days that they're with me in addition to that i did now get a certification this year to be able to teach other teachers so hopefully i will be able to set up a school soon and start doing that as well that's like a longer term goal but this retreat thing is something that i i genuinely enjoy so you mean set up a school like a brick and mortar space uh, so it does have to be a brick and mortar space um it a school is a virtual beam for it's it's on paper and you run programs that are a 200 hour ptc or you can run like a um um a meditation course and you can either teach people to become teachers or you can just teach people how to practice correctly or you can teach people um teach existing teachers more things like if i have a 200 hour certification ptc certification maybe i could teach them um a prenatal course so then they are equipped to teach uh, uh, pregnant women um tarni can i quickly ask what has yoga taught you as an individual mm. yoga i think has taught me to kind of go with the flow a little bit and not try to control everything so much try to be present more and 
enjoy what you have don't focus on what you want or what the next thing is yeah definitely have those things in mind but also be really happy for what you have because that itself is your privilege and you could have not had that either so i think it's really sort of taught me to be grateful and to accept what i what i can't change that that's lovely Love that I'm so philosophical. <laughs> maybe, maybe you are actually philosophical. I, I think anyone who pursues this path on on some subliminal level is right. I think it's just that some of us don't know it. You know, I honestly think that I really hated my life as a lawyer. I really like you know I can't cross the ceiling now without feeling like oh my god I have to go to work. I feel like anxiety if I have to cross the ceiling. Okay, I won't say anxiety. That's a loaded word, but I feel like something when I cross the ceiling. I'm like, I can't. I I don't go to town because I just can't. I just have such bad memories associated with that time that now I um, I really try to be more present because again over there I also felt like I was just doing whatever was expected from me and whatever I was told to do by my boss and my clients and this one and that one and I didn't really do anything for myself. So now it's kind of more of doing things for myself rather than doing things for X and Y and Z. And isn't doing things for the self like the most important? Only then you can do things for others. Right? Sure. Oh, my one of my teachers has this thing that you can't pour from an empty cup. So you kind of have to make sure that you have to be fulfilled in order to fulfill other people. Do you uh, live by any particular mantra? Is this does it keep changing for you, or this doesn't resonate? Um, I don't think I live by any mantra. I think I'm a little too um, like. I think I'm a little too. I would like to say practical for that because I my my brain is very kind of logic driven, so I don't really. Have a mantra. I just kind of feel like the only thing I I can think about is in tough times, this too shall pass. That's a good one. Do you have a a routine for your day that you follow and you swear by, and that is what gets you in the flow of the day and gets you to complete your day in a fulfilled way? Morning routine, yeah. night routine. Um, honestly, the one thing that really sets me up for my day is when I wake up. I like to have time by myself. I just like to wake up on my own without anybody around me. Finish my morning, whatever I need to do, and just sit with a glass of water and drink it in peace. That's all. And that kind of really sets the tone for the day. And if I feel rushed through that, then I really don't like it. And I I find that I'm a little bit off balance in the rest of my day. then around mid morning i also really like to just sit with a cup of tea and read the papers on on online right now and at the end of the night again i really like to spend half an hour reading something how do you deal with all that you are reading in terms of the news like the negative stuff that's going on and there's so much of it around us so at the beginning of this pandemic i was i'm pretty sure like everybody else glued to the news channels and i would be like what's happening how many cases 800 today 200 tomorrow i used to be like glued as you know all the statistics everything and then at a point i would just be like you know this is not making me feel better i need to stop so i just read news that gives me the highlights without anybody's opinion on it because um and it's really important in today's time to come to credible uh, come get your news from credible sources so i try to find credible sources that will give you facts like actual facts not alternate facts real facts um and that's about it and i spend just 5 or 10 minutes a day reading those facts and then i move on to something else you were just mentioning the pandemic how is the uh, lockdown bit for you you took on with uh, online classes pretty quickly but then you also 
got COVID, but you were still doing classes while you were unwell. Like a lot happened. How, yeah. how, how would you summarize it for yourself? Um, the pandemic has been very eventful for me. I mean, at a time you think you're, we're privileged enough to be sitting at home and letting our work happen online. That does happen for me, but there was a situation where I had to be in the hospital. Not I had to be in the hospital. As a caregiver, I was in the hospital, and I think I probably contracted COVID from there. And I actually had it um, oh, on my birthday. It was when I figured out I may have this thing because I couldn't smell or taste anything. And um, so we got tested, and it turns out we had it and whatever. But for me, honestly, I was like, if I'm supposed to spend 14, 17 days under uh, BMC, Bombay Municipal Corporation, 17 days is the isolation period. If I've spent 17 days in isolation, not leave my rooms or whatever, I need to do something with my time. There's only so much TV you can watch and only so many books you can read. You need to be able to engage with other people. And for me, my, my classes were that time, that like one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening or whatever it is was my time. So there was no way that I was giving that up. It would have uh, actually been worse in my recovery. So I just decided at that point that I would, as I'm sitting right now, sit and talk to the class and guide you through it and pin somebody else's video on the screen so that you have a visual aid as well as you have me uh, talking you through the class. And hopefully that would be fine. And we tried it out, I think for about 10 days I did that and everybody uh, did it fine. And I told all my students that yeah, I have COVID, but I want to continue classes. And they were like, that's fine. If you're okay, we're okay. And it worked out seamlessly. Uh, Tardi, do you have a small exercise or a small tip for, for people who are sitting at home, anything with your breath that you could show them that they can, like a quick fix or a quick hack or anything of that sort? Or I something that not you don't believe in, that's fine too. I think that. I think now for people sitting at home more than, um, I feel there are uh, three things that I would say that you need to kind of um, reset in the day. One is your eyesight because you're constantly looking at a screen, whether it's your laptop, your television, or your phone, right? Well, and I wake up with dry eyes almost every morning now. So I think a good way to do that is to, if you have the ability to do this, to kind of walk out a little bit in your compound, on your terrace. If you're uh, lucky enough to have a balcony, spend some time outside your four walls, just so that you get some fresh air um, into your body and you're not really focused and leave your phone away, of course. And so you're not really focused on your screen, so your eyesight can also refresh. You can go and watch um, the sunset where we live in Bombay, the sea is pretty close by or for those of us who are not in Bombay, if you can just manage to catch a little bit of nature in the day, whether it's again your terrace or your balcony or whatever, that's a great way to reset your eyesight. Um, for the breath, I would just really say when you're feeling like it's getting to be too much, take a really big breath in through the nose, stay with it for a few seconds, and exhale through the mouth. It's almost like a sigh to kind of let your physical tension out to the, the breath. And then you can come into more of a mindful breath, like really sitting tall, rolling your shoulders back, really shutting your eyes for a moment. And then you can go ahead, breathing in and slowly breathe out. And as you do this, just watch the response of your body. As you inhale, you will feel the chest rise and the belly rise. And as you exhale, you feel the belly pull towards the spine, the chest settle back into space. And then when you're ready, you can slowly blink open the eyes and come back to the present. And for your neck, which is another thing, we're kind of always on the phone, laptop, book, whatever. I would just say work your neck in the directions that it works in. So sit tall, roll the shoulders back. Look straight ahead of you and then look to the right. Come to center and really look to the left. Take your neck all the way. Look to center. Look up. Don't throw the head back. Just look as if there's something on your ceiling. Come to center and then look down towards your toes. 
come to center and then look straight ahead, right ear to the right shoulder, feeling this in the trap that is the neck and the shoulder area, coming to center and then dropping the left ear to the left shoulder, coming to center. And you kind of just really kind of reset your, this major joint of the head and the neck and the shoulders. So definitely work on your eyes, work on the breath and work on your neck. That was lovely. I feel like my neck is never without pain. There is always some pain in the neck. You were so right about that. Are you talking about proverbial or actual pain in the neck? Yeah, I was just going to say, Mani, are you talking about me? Am I the pain in the neck? No. <laughs> actual. <laughs> For sure. Proverbial, I can deal with. <laughs> that can come and go. But that was great. Yeah, yeah. I think this has been good. I think we can let uh, Tani go. We've We've got lots of amazing tips and um, lovely bits of her life and journey. 